You're listening to the Maritime Gardening Podcast, episode 135, brought to you by Vessi Seeds. Well, folks, gardening is an outdoor activity, and ticks are outdoors, and it is tick season. And today on this show, I brought an expert on ticks, Dr. Vet Lloyd from Mount Allison University. And we're going to talk about everything ticks today. Who is Dr. Vet Lloyd? She's a national expert on ticks and tick-borne diseases. She got her Bachelor of Science at the University of British Columbia, a Master of Science or the equivalent thereof from the University of Geneva. That's an interesting story. I'd love to hear that story. A PhD from the University of British Columbia. And then sometimes she found her way to New Brunswick, Sackville, New Brunswick. She teaches and conducts research, uh, conducts research at Mount Allison University. Her lab works on genetics of ticks and the pathogens they transmit. And she has many publications regarding ticks and tick-borne diseases and other stuff, sciences sort of stuff like that. And we're going to talk all about ticks today. Vet, how are you doing today? How are things in New Brunswick? Do you have any fires in New Brunswick? Uh, well, yeah, there are fires everywhere, it seems. Um, which is one way to deal with the ticks, but perhaps it's a little bit drastic. <laughs> exactly. Kind of Sodom and Gomorrah approach, I guess. Uh, yeah, there's uh, fires going on all around us. You can see yeah. Today, um, I took this whole week off to go fishing. And I was in the woods on the weekend, and my wife called me and said, "You got to come out of the woods because you're not allowed to be in the woods, <laughs> and you better not be having any fires in the woods because you're not allowed to be doing that either." And all while I was there, I had ticks. I had ticks on me here and there and everywhere, um, doing everything I can to uh, avoid them. But they're a natural consequence of fishing because um, uh, you're not. It's not a controlled environment, right? You're you're yeah. just walking through wilderness, and you're you're kind of. You're, you're finding all the paths of least resistance, which are all the same paths that the things that, you know, the ticks come off of, like the deer and stuff. Yeah. Um, so it was a real tick fest. But now, 20, 20 minute drive from my house, there's an uncontrollable wildfire. And all day today, you can smell smoke. And it's just really on I, my house backs onto a big forest. It's quite, <clears throat> it's quite unnerving. <laughs> yes. Uh, as you can imagine. Are, are you like in a rural setting? Uh, yes, I am. I'm uh, right on the Tantramar Marshes. So if I'm not looking at you, I'm looking at a whole bunch of grass, which is lovely, and a bit of haze from the forest fires. So there's a lot of burning going out there. Really? And I was actually just uh, before this, uh, this thing needed to go for a walk. So we were out in the woods and I was suddenly thought, oh, wait, we're not supposed to be doing that right now. But yeah. anyway. Yeah, our premier just shut the whole, I mean, I think yeah, on Monday, I think eight new fires started. Yeah. And he just totally lying, kind of <laughs> just sort of lost it. He's like, all yep. right, well, you know, I asked you all to be good, but you weren't being good. So now no ATVs and no parties and no dancing and no nothing, you know. <laughs> that reminds me of um, the previous premier we had um, during the COVID and he, he gave a famous line on TV said, stay the, he had a, he's a really big, yeah. tall man with these sort of, you know, you know, angry, <laughs> I, angry eyes. And he's like, stay the blazes home. And it became like a meme, right? <laughs> um, so that's kind of what the situation right now. Anyway, we're not going to talk about, we're going to get our minds off of that. And, and actually the, the, the sky just cleared. There's been a haze all day, like a fog, but it wasn't fog. It was just like part, very, various particulate that smells really weird. Um, yeah, that's because uh, you've sent it over here. Thanks. <laughs> that's coming to you from here. Um, I'm not sure which which fire is responsible for our haze, but uh, yeah, I guess I guess there is. I was reading. There's another one not too far from the border. I think. Yeah. Yes. Um, there's three fires that are out of control, and one of them is up by the border. One's in the biggest one's in Yarmouth, and that's just like yeah. you know, um, yeah, it's crazy. Um, okay. So, I don't so, fires, more ticks. <laughs> yes, that's right, more ticks, which, you know, that's the good thing about the fire is the ticks. <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, fire is a great way to deal with ticks. Um, okay, so let's talk about ticks now. So, when I got the tick, I got them right, right here. I got a little in a little baggie here, okay? And you can talk about why people might want to, if they find a tick on them, this one was in me, right? Um, why they might want to put one in a bag. Um, actually, when I initially found it, I, was, I came home, 
I was undressing in the bedroom. I saw it right here. I went, ah! And I, I just ripped it off. And I, but like the last, what you're not supposed to do. And you could tell everybody what you supposed to But I did the exact instinctive thing of, ah, ah, And I just threw it in the trash. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I was supposed to take it off carefully. And, you know, uh, not supposed to just, I was like going through the trash with my wife trying to find <laughs> it. Uh, <laughs> like an idiot, right? <laughs> so, um, okay. Tick identification. How, you know, why do you want to, when you get a tick on you, want, why do you want to carefully remove it and carefully identify what type of tick it is? Okay. So um, you did the one thing very right, which is removing it. Uh, <laughs> just sort of leaving it there to see what happens. Not a great idea. Not a problem. <laughs> yeah. So you want to get it off you. Um, a, there's a lot of mythology about how to do it best, whether you twist them or you pull them or whatever. Um, really, as long as you get it off you, that's what's important. If you do it slowly, uh, you're more likely to get all of the tick as opposed to leaving tick bits inside of you. <laughs> and I do hope that you've had your dinner and you're not planning to go have dinner and hmm, tick bits. There's a good image. Yes, I have. Um, <laughs> So move it slowly. <laughs> yes. And so once you've got the tick um, and throwing it in the garbage is not the worst thing because it's dry. A lot of people flush it, in which case retrieval becomes, well, impossible. The reason you want to do that, the reason you want to save the tick is not because we love ticks and we want everyone to live. I'd actually be very happy if every tick died. But... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all the problem. Um, but if you can get most of the tick out, you can see what kind of tick it is. So there are three types of ticks that commonly are found on humans, this part of the world in Maritime Canada. Um, one of them does not carry Lyme disease almost all. So it's it's mostly safe. There's no such thing as a good tick but there is a better tick and a worse tick. So if you've got the not the worst tick, that's good news. And the way you tell is the ticks that are not too bad, those are the dog ticks. They're a bit bigger and they've got little spots of white on their back. That's what I got. Yeah, yes. So if you had to have a tick on you, that was well done, congratulations. That was the type of tick to have. <laughs> You are clearly a very skilled and thoughtful tick collector. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So much thought went into it, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, the smaller ticks that are darker, no white blotches, uh, those are either, uh, they're technically called the black-legged tick. Uh, many people call them the deer tick because it's shorter. Also, the black-legged ticks have dark brown legs, not black legs, which I find annoying because i'm literally minded but anyway yeah um, that's fair you know i think if it, from a classification point of view yeah you wouldn't want to call it the red spotted out a red spotted spider and have it have no red spots um, yeah so, but yeah. i mean it's bad enough to say the black leg tick you really want to say the really dark brown leg tick yeah Okay, so uh, how do you tell it? How do you tell that one? For, aside from the size, there's there's a website, the Nova Scotia website. Mm -hmm. It only has like one picture of each kind. It's got a, I think it's got a male and a female, or an immature, yeah. and maybe it's a nymph and an adult. That's it. It doesn't have like multiple pictures. Um, yeah. So one probably the best way if if you're not really familiar with ticks and you don't look at it and say, ah, clearly a dog tick, yeah. uh, you can send, a, take a picture of it. Again, a good reason to keep the tick. Take a good picture of its back from the head end and then send it to a website called eTick. It's eTick.ca. E -tick. Huh. And what they do is they take the picture, it's farmed out to entomologists in whatever province you're at. And then they'll send you an email back saying, this is this type of tick. The other advantage of that website is you can look at other people's ticks and see what everyone else's tick looked like. So that's a good resource. 
you can also see how many other ticks of what kind are in your area. Right. Uh, what it does not do, though, is tell you whether the tick that bit you was infected or not. Yeah. So not every black-legged tick is, or, or deer tick, if you prefer that, is infected. The chance of them being affected, infected with the Lyme disease bacteria varies depending on where you are, but it's still, there's no way you can look at it from the outside and see. Right. So to do, to figure out if your particular tick was infected, you have to send the tick in and then there's DNA testing to see if the Lyme disease pathogen is in the tick or not. That's right. information you and your healthcare provider can then use to figure out how to deal with the tick bite. Right. So that's the most surefire way to make, to find out if you've been, you've gotten a Lyme disease injection or infection yes. is to mail the ticks and the tick somewhere and they'll analyze the tick juices. <laughs> yeah, that's an excellent description. <laughs> okay. um, because so let's, let's say the, so that's the most reliable way because you're, you're, you can yeah. find it in the, but let's say you're at a campfire and you take the tick and you throw it in the fire. No one okay. should have campfires right now, but let's say you're doing yes. that. And I've done that. I've done that many times and because you're so angry and so hate filled, <laughs> you want it yeah. to find, you know, so, okay, now I've got no tick and I've got a bite and I don't know if I'm going to be horribly ill or just fine. And, you know, what do I do? Um, well, uh, First of all, if something was inside of you, it has punctured the skin. So a surface disinfectant uh, is a good idea, the same way as with any cut or scrape. However, if there's Lyme disease involved, that's not going to do the trick. Um, you can get to, uh, in most provinces now, uh, a pharmacist can prescribe treatment. Uh, you need to find a pharmacist who's comfortable doing that, who's, re who's taken the training and so forth. Um, the treatment is a, a sing single dose, which is sometimes one pill taking two pills together or taking two pills separated in time. Depends on what your pharmacist will tell you. That is effective if the tick had not been lurking on your body, squirting in the pathogens for any length of time. If the tick has been feeding on you and you would think, ah, well, I'm gonna see a tick on me. Yes, if it's on your nose, you, well, perhaps someone will have noticed it and said, hey, you've got a tick on your nose. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah. Um, but a lot of times ticks will crawl into the dark, warm crevices of your body they want to feed for a nice long period of time. They can feed for up to seven days, even longer if they're small. So they don't want you interrupting their meal, which would be your blood. Uh, they'd like to keep sucking your blood and squirting in uh, their pathogens for as long as they possibly can. So they, one way they do that is they inject an anesthetic so you don't feel the tick bite. The other way they do that is just hiding so they go into cracks and crevices and ticks are small and they're sometimes hard to see in the cracks and crevices. I mean, don't answer this. It's a rhetorical question, but how often do you check out all your cracks and crevices? I don't even want to look at them. Like, you know, <laughs> I don't even want to look at myself, you know, like, yeah, I just, you know, <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, I mean, you don't and yeah. you don't, you, you, you rarely ever do it and rarely do you ever want to. Um, no. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And unfortunately, one of the best ways to protect from ticks is to do a routine tick check. It becomes part of the routine for people in essentially Southern Canada, but certainly this part of the world. And certainly for people like gardeners, where we like to be outside and we like to be down in the ground. Yeah. So that's kind of where the plants are. Yeah. So, we need to do that. It's a good thing to do. It's a healthy thing to do. But at the end of the day, um, check yourself for ticks, which means taking clothes off, uh, either finding someone uh, who's willing to have a look at you, or if that does opportunity doesn't present them, 
itself, a mirror will work well too. That's right. Yeah, the, the least the least sexy uh, thing you can do with your spouse. Um. <laughs> I've been told it can be fun, but I suspect <laughs> the novelty wears off no. when you're doing it for each other every night. But anyway, uh, yes, <laughs> probably the least sexy thing you can do with another person. Yes, exactly. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's that. Um, now, what about, um, what was I going to ask? When they give you, so is there a test they give you at the pharmacy or they just say, you just say, I've been bitten by a tick and they give you an antibiotic or something like that? Uh, that would be roughly what should happen. Uh, they may ask you what kind of tick, what did it look like, which is a bit more difficult if you'd thrown it in the fire or flush it down the toilet, yeah. um, which is a good reason to keep the tick. Um, but it's an antibiotic. You can get tested afterwards. The test looks for antibodies against the Lyme disease bacteria. So one problem with that test is you don't get antibodies immediately. It's not pathogen spring. Antibodies are good to go. So you've got to wait for a couple of weeks, which is unnerving. And some people develop antibodies really strong antibody response other people don't um some people are on medications that suppress the antibody response all of which me or some people have been infected with a pathogen different from what the text uh test is looking for right right so, so it's, it's very possible the likelihood of getting a false negative is, there is uh, a possibility of it and people argue with great vigor about what the exact probabilities are of false positives and false negatives. You know, you got to keep scientists busy somehow. So that's a good way to keep us busy. That's right. But for practical purposes, for real people, yes, there's a test, but uh, it can't completely prove that you've got Lyme disease and it can't completely prove that you don't. Right. So the other way you get the test and it's negative. The other way is you just start feeling awful. <laughs> yes. Well, getting sick, that would be a clue that you've got something. <laughs> yes. And the bullseye pattern, that is sort of the classic thing. That's, that is not, my understanding is that that is not a reliable indicator. You don't always get that. Yeah. Uh, not everyone gets that. Uh, again, people argue about the, what proportion get it. Um, the, the numbers go anywhere from 30% to 70% get it. Um, the other, but there's again some issues. If you're bitten in your head, um, you may not, you may not be able to see a rash, even if it's there. Tricky to see a rash if it's on your backside. Yeah. Um, and people with darker skin color, um, yes. harder to see a rash. Right, right, right. Yeah. And some people just don't make rashes. Oh, there's some people are just like that. Yeah, they're they're, they're like, just not rashy kind of people. <laughs> I guess that you'd think that would be a, a, a benefit, but I guess in this case, it's not. I got a buddy that uh, he was camping in Yarmouth last summer and he felt really awful after a week or so. And then he had, uh, he had the bullseye. So mm. he got the antibiotic and um, yeah, he's doing better. But, but it, he, so that's another question. So, I mean, I used to be quite irate that there seemed to be no, no vaccine, no, like I did a little bit of reading about this a number of years ago, that there was, there was effort and research put into developing something like a vaccine. Um, and that one was developed and then the whole thing got kiboshed. There still is a vaccine you can give a dog, mm -hmm. but there's no vaccine you can give a person. And I mean, the reason I was irate was just, I'm an avid outdoors person. It's not because I'm gardening, because I, I sort of, I feel like I can control things there a little bit. It's more, I mean, not a hundred, I know you're saying, no, you can't. Um, but, my, you know, we'll talk more about that a bit later on when we talk about prevention. Um, I, I know it's not a hundred, certainly not a hundred percent, but when I'm out fishing or in the woods, uh, all that, I spent a lot, I love being in the woods. I love being in the woods. And uh, I mean, I'm down in there. I'm just in everything, right? So like a dog, like an animal. 
And I have to think, I mean, so you're rolling in the grass, peeing on fire hydrants? Boy, <laughs> say no. <laughs> uh, when you're fishing in the rivers in Nova Scotia, they're all banked. So yeah. you're you're forever, you're crawling down the banks and crawling up the bank. You're, you're crawling, you got waders on, but you're crawling down and crawling up. So you're just going through, you're on your hands and knees a lot, like a baby, right? Um, but I mean, that's just what I do for recreation. I don't rely on it. I have incredible compassion or concern for people that make a living uh you know in the logging industry or agricultural yeah. industries people that just can't evolve. i mean i can just choose to have fun another way i mean i won't be as happy but i could just do that i can stay home and play video games zero risk right uh, and when i go to work i'm in an office so there's, there's zero risk um but i mean someone who's out there doing stuff um mm. so you know do you have any knowledge of what we weren't going to talk about this. It wasn't on my list of things to bring up, and I don't know how knowledgeable you are on it, but is there anything like that that exists anywhere in the world? Um, so there was a tick vaccine, uh, a Lyme disease vaccine, and uh, it was withdrawn for uh, either, depending who you talk to. <laughs> That's what he thinks about it. He's not happy about it at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, either due to side effects or to the anti-vax movement or something else. Right. Uh, but regardless, it, it wasn't selling. So it wasn't selling. Not making money. Uh, you are right. You can get vaccines for your dogs. They're not. They're up to the third or and soon the fourth generation vaccine. Wow. Um. There is a vax, another human Lyme vaccine in clinical trials. It'll be some time. And uh, I, I have not seen any of the preliminary data, so I can't say any more about how well it works, whether the side effects um, and how it would work for people who have been previously exposed. That That's perhaps one of the big concerns that as more and more people are being exposed, they're going to be people with latent Lyme disease infection. Right. So will a vaccine make it better or worse? Um, uh, stay tuned. We'll find out. This experiment is being done right now, so we'll find out. Is there people that are just can shrug it off? Like, so I got a, I got a black legged tick. It's chock full of Lyme disease. It sucks on me for a week and then crawls away. And... I'm fine anyway. Is there, is that? It's, that's an excellent question. Patient zero sort of thing. Is that? Is yeah. That um, it, it's a great question. And it's a question that needs to be answered, uh, particularly as we're getting more ticks uh, and they're expanding their range and more and more are infected. So, <laughs> excuse me. I suspect eventually we will end up with an answer to that, but Lyme disease, for the most part, is really under-researched. Really? Uh, so that, again, is a very practical question. People who are living in Lyme disease areas need need to have answered. I guess we need more high pro We need more Elon Musk types to get Lyme disease, I guess. Um, you know, <laughs> more of these high-profile people that uh, will not stand for no answers, uh, you know. Well, that would probably do it, but I really <laughs> wish Lyme disease on anyone. No, but yeah, if you want a disease cure, it infect the king, right? And then, um, and then all his uh, horses and all his men will be put to work uh, finding the cure. Speaking of diseases, mm -hmm. so Lyme, Lyme disease is the one we're concerned about, but there's other diseases that ticks carry. Um, so, I mean, I don't know how many there are, but were the, and you said there was three types of ticks. I mean, you, you yep. only mentioned two, so you should mention the third kind and then maybe, you know, which ones carry the nasty diseases that mess you up. Okay. Right. The third type of tick, it's called a groundhog tick. Groundhog it's tick. Kind of, yeah, it's kind of the, and you find it not just on groundhogs, but uh, foxes and cats. Um, and sometimes humans. Uh, it's kind of a blonde cousin of the deer Worst tick. name ever. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Yeah. Um, so 
uh, it looks very much like the deer tick, so it's not really that worth worrying about differentiating it. So really, if people can tell a dog tick from a deer tick, that'll do the trick. I see. Okay. And do the deer ticks and the groundhog ticks, oh, sorry, let's talk about dog tick ticks, dog ticks and groundhog ticks, because those are the ones we're not as worried about. Do they, is there a chance, do they carry anything that's nasty? Okay, uh, so the dog ticks, we're not as worried about them. They okay. can carry uh, the bacteria that cause spotted fevers, things like Rocky Mountain spotted fever. They can also carry tular the bacteria that causes tularemia, which involves having your body sort of fester and ooze and rot. Uh, that's not super fun. The good news, and there is good news, is we've tested hundreds and hundreds of them from this region and we haven't found a single tick that carries any of the pathogens we've looked at mm. so at least in this area they seem to be quite resolutely boring and a boring tick there's no good tick but a boring tick is certainly as good as it can get tularemia is that thing i think uh, like i think if you're um cleaning a rabbit like yeah. you kill a rabbit you you don't want to have an open cut or something like that exactly you, uh, yeah yeah you're I much more li yeah it does exist in wildlife um and particularly and also raccoons and so forth if you see white spots on the liver the liver uh, yeah that that's a re really good time to back off um right. and better yet if you're if you're dressing a carcass gloves are not a bad idea <laughs> right 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 okay um, okay, so in terms so, of the black legged, or, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so the, so the dog ticks are not too bad here. Okay. Now we do have the deer ticks, so those are the problem. Okay, so what what do they carry in addition to? <laughs> can you get a two for one or a three for one? What, oh, what you have? can, which is right. really bad news. Um, so they're carrying in addition to the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. They've got a parasite that causes a disease called babesiosis. Um, that'll, it's a little crawly, hairy parasite that lives in your blood cells and bursts them. This, ah. isn't, this isn't really good for you. Uh, they've got another bacteria that causes anaplasmosis, which again, bursts your red blood cells and it's not great for your capillaries and blood vessels. Um, there's a virus that causes encephalitis, which is not something that's particularly good for your brain. And those are the common ones. Do we have, I mean, I know the encephalitis is um, common in, I think, Eastern Europe, um, or maybe Europe in general, but do, do we have that here as well? Yes. Um, we have it all. Yeah, we do. It's less common here. So in Europe, you actually, it's so common that there's a vaccine against that virus. Right. And it's routinely given to school kids in most endemic countries. Uh, we have a variation of that virus and it's actually, it has been found here. It was in fact named after the town in Canada where it was found. And it's throughout uh, North America, Canada, mostly the Eastern part, but they'll, it'll be everywhere oh my goodness so that's here yeah so when uh, when are we getting our vaccine for that <laughs> uh well i guess we I, I want a, certain, it. <laughs> a certain number of people to get sick with it and then it justifies the cost of vaccines uh, uh, which is just a really unfortunate reality that's an uh, it's an epidemiology public health budget yeah. decision yes yeah, which doesn't make you feel great if you're in the hospital with the disease. No. So what do they do? How would you even know you had that? I guess you just feel terrible. And uh, well, yeah, if it's severe, you your brain is swelling and getting squished, and you're in the hospital, and they do their best to support you until your immune system looks after the virus, or it doesn't. Wow. That's not very good. Can't they just put bleach yeah. in you or something? Um, <laughs> that, was a, that was a joke. <laughs> yeah. I'm not recommended. No, not exactly. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> couldn't resist. Um, 
Okay, so so we've got okay, so it's their black legged tick, and there's like they've got. I mean, so probability wise, because sometimes people think about these things. You know, what's it called? The problem of the discontinuous mind. Um, so, what is there an estimate for this? What proportion of black legged ticks carry Lyme disease? What proportion of black legged ticks carry encephalitis? Mm -hmm. uh, virus, et cetera, et cetera. I can't remember yeah. the names of other things you mentioned. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the the most common one will be the Lyme disease bacteria. How common it is depends on where you are. Uh -huh. So there are some hot spots in Nova Scotia where we're getting up to 70% being infected. Wow. Their spots are a mere 40%. Uh, this part of the world, when I'm out in my garden, I've got 20% risk. Yay wow. me. Um, yeah. So it's kind of Russian roulette with ticks, all of which is a good argument for being aggressive in your tick bite prevention. Yes. Because no one really wants to play Russian roulette with tiny little things that squirt pathogens into you. Um, Especially when those pathogens, you know, explode yeah. your uh, blood cells like something out of a Ridley Scott movie. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Now, the the good news is the virus is way less common. Uh, but what is being found in Europe where they've had a problem and also the New England states where they've been dealing with this problem for much longer is the people who get really, really sick are the ones who have not one pathogen, but two or three or four. Oh, cetera. like simultaneously. Yes. How would you die? Because they that? won the tick lottery and they got a tick with everything in it. Good Lord. Man. Yeah, this is not. Uh, okay, so. Um, prevalence. So what are we, yeah. I mean, the, the place where I like to go fishing, which is in Hans County, Nova Scotia, I guess you'd call it West Hans. Um, 2006, when I first started fishing there, there was no ticks. Mm -hmm. I never had them on me. And now, um, there's a long trail I hike down to get to the river. Uh, I used to hike that wearing hiking shoes. Um, and now I hike it wearing hip waders because I find they're pretty good at keeping the, yes. they, they don't grab onto them and they just don't, yeah. the tick doesn't yeah. sense. It's sort of like dead non-animal material is my theory. Yeah. I'm talking to you previously. Um, but it's, it sucks hiking in hip waders. They're not comfortable for a long, you know, a couple of kilometer hike. Yeah, uh, but they weren't there in 2006. There was just nothing. And then at some point, I just noticed every time I walked anywhere, I had doing anything, there would be ticks. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime you walk through anywhere with grass, ticks, yep. you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, what's what is happening? Um, what happened? I don't know if it's a, it's a what is I happening? I don't well, like the history of the world, but <laughs> <laughs> what the well, hell is going on? <laughs> well, mummy tick meets daddy tick and they like each other very, very much. Now, it doesn't take a lot for ticks. Um, <laughs> so the moment a female will get a good blood meal, uh, which means she's sucking blood for three to five days. If someone doesn't catch her and kill her, which would be the case for a lot of wildlife. They're not doing tick checks. The ticks feed, they get their full meal, they drop off. That female can lay two to 3,000 eggs. If you think about it, that's going to make a lot of baby ticks really quickly. Does that female need to find a male or is that female all just sort of ready to go? Uh, the male will find her. Um, generally okay. speaking, right. uh, he, can, he can find her on they smell each other. So they sort of crawl towards each other or sometimes they meet on, you know, a romantic deer, some uh, evening wandering about a deer uh, or a groundhog or a fox or, you know, or a romantic, mouse, whatever. Romantic rat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I see. Oh my God. So, I mean, how did it, when I was a child uh, in the seventies and eighties, my parents would tell me about the ticks were in like Yarmouth, Shelburne, the sort of south, the western end of the province. Yeah. And I lived in Lower Sackville and there was no ticks there. And now, I mean, if you pull over on the side of the highway near where I grew up to pee in the bushes, this time of year, hmm. you're getting it. You're going to get ticks on you. They're, they're, they're mm -hmm. just everywhere there. Yeah. So, I mean, why, 
what enabled the ticks to just migrate and move up? I mean, imagine you didn't grow up in New Brunswick. I'm, I'm going to guess because you did your uh, undergraduate in BC. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, why are they, is, is this a climate change thing or just a, a, just a natural evolutionary migrational thing? Um, it's mostly climate change, uh, but uh, ticks will spread from a focal population. Uh, you've got a whole bunch of ticks in one area and they'll get on a coyote or a deer or something and that animal will travel, ticks drop off somewhere else. So they do naturally spread. But um, it, one of the things that used to control ticks was a lot of snow which would basically squash them down and they didn't have enough time to get up, get a meal and get through their whole life cycle before, hey, more snow. So one of the things that has happened in this part of the world is not only warmer, but a lot drier. So, I mean, even in the time I've, in the 20 years I've been in New Brunswick, I've seen a huge difference in the amount of snowpack in the south of New Brunswick. And Nova Scotia now, I mean, you you don't have large chunks of days with feet of snow on the ground. Well, we snow, lose, but... we, I mean, where I live, we regularly lose all our snow throughout the winter. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. In Jan January, it'll get snow and then it'll disappear. Yeah. And it'll get snow and then it'll disappear and then it'll get snow and disappear. So you're saying it's shorter, shorter, less, shorter summers, shorter spring and summers. And less snow. That... Less snow. And uh, so the ticks don't like two things. One is they don't like being f f uh, squashed under snow. They don't particularly care, but they can't go get their food, which is blood. So that'll do them in eventually. And they don't like high heat. So the more time of the year that they can get out and get food because the snow isn't squashing them down, the more females will find a blood meal and will make a whole bunch of little baby ticks. What about, um, so one thing that'll happen here is that in February, February, uh, you know, we'll get a big snowstorm and then it'll rain for two days and all the snow will disappear. Mm -hmm. And then it'll drop to minus 20 Celsius and everything, the ground freezes. Mm -hmm. Does that yet, can that kill the tick or they are encased in ice or do they just go down and get away from it or like what? Are yeah, unfortunately, you would think that that would do them in because the you know a couple bitter days it certainly does the plants in, but the ticks can burrow right down into the leaf litter. They'll go down a few centimeters, and they can stand being a bit cold. You've got to take an adult down to about minus fifteen or so for it to freeze. And you think, well, okay, the air temperature is minus 30, that should do it. But down in the soil, it's not that cold. Oh, uh, yeah, it's just like frozen. It's 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 ice yeah. cube. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so the, yeah, they, they can just freeze. Mm -hmm. And it's like they're in cryogenic uh, uh, sus suspended animation. Yeah. yeah. And they just then reanimate. <laughs> yes. Wow, I see. So, so that doesn't do anything. Now, what about um, I've got a friend and he lives next to a river and it's a tidal river. Okay? Mm -hmm. So there's salt water coming up, fresh water coming down. And his there's a road and his house is between the road and the river. They never have ticks there. Yeah. Other side of the road, mm -hmm. ticks everywhere. Yep. So what is going on there? Salt. Just ticks the, Ticks do not like to be dried out right. and salt will dry them out. So beach, that's a good reason to go to a beach um, or a tidal river. Those yeah. are good places. The only drawback of beaches and tidal rivers is the gardening is lousy around them. <laughs> but right no ticks. There. So you're saying just because of the, the vapor in the air, there's a degree of salinity that yeah. they, they're just, they're wary of it and they just sort of, oh, I don't like it over there. I'm going over this way sort of thing. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I see. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Well, I should look for a house like that. Uh, <laughs> well, the tidal river sounds nice. Oh, yeah. That would be nice. Well, until uh, the tides get too high, I suppose. But uh, yeah. Okay. 
So that's a, a prevalence. Okay. So also, assuming you can't buy a house on the waterfront. <laughs> yes. And some people can, but for the rest of the world, um, I just want to sort of go over the the go tos practical tick prevent tick bite preventions. Okay. So you're going in the woods. Uh, you're wearing your hip waders. Great idea. But as you said, not ideal for uh, hiking. You can use uh, uh, repellent sprays. The ones that are actually tested on ticks are probably better than the ones that are just for mosquitoes because mosquitoes are wimpy compared to ticks. Okay, so such as? Uh, so anything, go into any commercial store and if it says uh, tested on ticks, they usually have a little tick symbol. Uh, right. Typically they contain uh, picaridin or icaridin. Uh, that's the active ingredient in black peppers. Right. It's the synthetic version because squashing a lot of black peppers is expensive. Not cost effective. <laughs> yeah. Um, so those work well. Uh, natural repellents, if they've been tested on ticks, great. Uh, if it's untested, you're doing the testing. So pay attention. That's the thing. Uh, How do you, like at the corner store there, you know, it'll have a thing and it's just some concoction someone made and they'll say, great for ticks. And yeah. like, and it, I'm guessing the person who made it, you know, some combination of uh, citronella and tea tree oil or something like that. And they'll say, great for ticks because they wear it and they've never gotten a tick on them, mm -hmm. which is just, um, you know, that's, that is not... Um, the right way to, that is not yeah. the right way to arrive at a conclusion <laughs> yeah i mean it's, so if you're doing that you're doing the testing so yeah. just be very aware that it might work or it might not work um even if you're work, wearing something that has been tested it's nothing is 100 percent uh but the last uh type of repellent you can use are is something like ant spray that has permethrin in it with that, you want to avoid putting it on your skin because it's not good for you, but you can put it on your clothes, let it dry. Right, right. Your shoes. So that gives you another layer of protection. Then there's the don't give the ticks easy access to your body. So, yeah, em embarrassing but true. The first tick I got on me this season, I looked down. I mean, it, it was... A formal event so i couldn't really tuck my pants into my socks without looking silly <laughs> but sure enough that's exactly what the tick did crawled right up my leg and then settled in behind my knee um irritating but i got yeah. it i found it that evening so that's okay you're saying you should tuck your pants into your socks and tuck your shirt yeah. into your pants and yeah, as, what, ideally, you know, that's because that way it, they have to, you might see it coming up your shirt as opposed to going right. up your, up your inside. Yeah. And that works some, sometimes there, it's not exactly fashion forward. Um, no, not. <laughs> uh, boots will work as well uh, as well. The higher, the better. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's what about, I mean, because a lot of, um, see, the, the popular thing to wear among anglers is these neoprene waders. And to me, they're fabric-like and they're easy to crawl and grab up, right? I wear like old-fashioned rubber ones yeah, because um, I think they're more tick-proof. Um, but they're getting harder and harder to find because these anglers like the, I don't know why they like these neoprene things, but I think it's because you wear, a, you, wear you, you put that into a shoe. Yeah. Right. So you got a special shoe. So it's maybe more comfortable um, for being in. But yeah. I don't know how how good those neoprene waders are at you know keeping the um that's a good question okay so i think i mean i, I came up with the waiter idea because of my understanding of how ticks find you you're mm -hmm. walking through the woods why are they going on your shoe what what's drawing I mean, how are they they're on a blade of grass i guess yeah. just trying to sense the universe and wait for their moment what activates the tick to ah, grab onto that and they can seem pretty slow to me how do they yeah, get they on your how do you get on yeah, it? They're, they're not scampering anywhere, at least right. not the ticks we have here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if you brush by them, they're smelling you. So if you're breathing, they can smell the carbon dioxide on your breath. Uh, Before so, you even arrive, they're like, oh, there's yeah. someone coming. Oh, I see. Yeah. 
and and they smell sweat and all the sm body scents we produce. So you can't really, short of being dead, you can't not be attractive to a pig. <laughs> I see, and that's I guess. I mean, we don't we don't sense this because we don't have good smelling. But like you think about if you've ever been around a really really dirty person, um, you know where they you know like I've, there's a dollar store near where I work. And there's all types of people that go in there. And there's some people, you can tell where they've been mm. when they're not there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. And you can tell they're coming before they arrive. Right? Yeah. So that's how ticks feel about us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I don't think a lot of people understand how, you know, you, there's just this cloud of cloud of material mm. that your body leaves all around it, it's, but you can't see it but some things can and they, their livelihood yeah. depends on. So there's this cloud of human filth stench, uh, probably very taste. It probably would smell like a nice hot steak. Oh uh, yeah. Like barbecue I mean, to them. This is saying food. food. It's the coming. Best food ever. Right. Right. Okay. So then they, they're waiting for some, so they, they smell you first and then they're waiting for some, some vibration or some stimuli, something nearby, to, and just waiting to grab. Well, you got to be close enough that they can grab, grab they you. They don't come into you. They're grabbing you. Yeah. You're, you're coming As to you them. Go by. Yeah. They're grabbing. So, which However, means, which means that if you're walking through a field, you could be like alert. There are probably hundreds of ticks. Yeah. But you don't, they don't have the pleasure of being able to grab onto you. Yeah. So if you if you manage to walk all the way around the ticks, uh, sort of like a minefield, good for you. But <laughs> as you can't see them, it's kind of tricky. It's, it's unlikely. Yes. OK. All right. So that's a but, good. Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So back to your hip waders. They don't really like the smell of rubber. Right. Um, I don't know how they feel about neoprene. And the best way to find out would be to ask all the anglers wearing neoprene waders about their tick experience. Yes, and I found that, like, you wonder how the tick I had on me. So, I mean, I wore the hip waders in. There was one place uh, a couple of weeks ago I went and I was camping. So I took the waders off when I was around camp. Um, now, when I'm around camp, it wasn't uh, grass and stuff like that. It was what you'd call duff, you know, just pine needle forest floor. Um, and I was wearing hiking shoes. Uh I had my shoe, my socks tucked into my shoes. Um, but I still, so what I did was I took DEET and I rubbed it into my shoes and I rubbed it into mm. my socks and I rubbed it like right up to about my knee on my pants. Yeah. I, you know, did that. Yeah. I still got ticks on me anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, just do it, just doing that, just it lo maybe lowers the probability, but it's not a, yeah, it's not a force field. Yeah. And DEET, uh, if you can get a repellent that has multiple repel repellents in it, so DEET plus something else or something else and something else, uh, yes. so not just one chemical, oh. that will work better than just plain old uh, single product repellent. But even no matter what you use, nothing will be 100%, as yes. you found out. Yes. And is there any, so I mean, that uh, you mentioned uh, um, erythrin, picardin. We talked about deep. There was one other thing you mentioned, isn't there? Another P uh, word? Uh, no, those are all the Ps. Pyrethrin, okay. And the pyrethrin is the one you don't want on your skin. Yeah. I, I use a pyrethrin insecticide in my garden. There's a, yeah. it's a, like a combination of pyrethrin and um, I can't remember the, something salts of potassium salts of fatty acids right that's what yeah. it is insecticidal soap mm -hmm. um but uh yeah i guess that pyrethrin is good stuff but i guess you don't want it to on your skin especially in high concentrations yeah um, now Breathing I guess it. in terms of your your research what do you i mean you've got i, I went and looked on your your sort of cv and you got a lot of impressive list of publications but I mean, just as an academic, as a researcher, what what are like the, the main things that are your your intellectual curiosity? What what are you trying to figure out? Um, 
so there are a lot of researchers who are very much interested in the nitty gritty of how the Lyme disease bacteria survives in the body, what it's doing in the tick. And all of that's really interesting and really important. Um, and I think that's fantastic information to have. That's not our interest. Mostly what we work on is how communities and people are dealing with ticks, dealing with the pathogens and dealing with getting sick. So it's very applied work. Um, for example, Lunenburg, pretty much ground zero for ticks. People there have a lot of, have found a lot of really practical ways to reduce their risk and still go about their daily lives. So if you want expertise on landscaping to reduce your tick exposure, go to the webpage of the Lunenburg Lime Association. Lots of really good, useful tips. Right. So that interests me, how people are living with ticks, because we're not going to make them go away, uh, short of torching the whole province, but let's not go that way. No. Um, and then also how people are managing when more and more people in communities are, as we've just said, nothing's perfect. So say your tick repellents don't work. Say you don't notice the tick. So say that tick was infected and you get ill. Say you don't get a diagnosis. Maybe you don't have a doctor. Uh, maybe you can't access healthcare, which is happening to more and more people. Yes. So how are people coping with that? We're getting more people who are now going through the early Lyme disease stage to the late Lyme disease stage, the disease is worse, they're sicker. Uh, are they able to work? Does someone in their family have to work less so that they can look after their sick family member? How are families coping? How are communities coping? And then also the very practical question is, there are doctors who are treating Lyme patients, which treatments work and which don't? <laughs> I because see. that's pretty important. I see. So you're, it's almost like you're, it's not, I mean, some of the research is almost, um, you know, anthropological, I guess, but I mean, it's almost like you're, you're, it's, it's like everything you're, you're, you look, you're observing every, everywhere where you can observe like a laboratory, mm -hmm. what are the humans doing to deal with the ticks? Yes. Um, and what's working for those humans, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't do it. You can't, you can't, you can't do an experiment, but the experiment's happening. Exactly. So you just, yeah. You know, uh, you're, you're making, you're, you're observing the experiment. You're doing field research. This is field research, isn't yeah. it? Yes. Yeah. 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 You're watching the Congratulations. The you're a very interesting subject. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You're doing the field research. That's right. You're watching, you know, you're watching the primates <laughs> and how they deal with this big problem. <laughs> Uh, that's very interesting. So back to being slightly more serious. Prevention, that's a good start. Checking for ticks, because if you find the tick, you've got a lot more options than if you don't find the ticks. Right. Uh, if you start to get sick, particularly if you have funny rashes, do your best to find a healthcare provider and keep asking and keep advocating for yourself, because a healthy person suddenly becoming desperately ill is not normal. Right. And I say this from my own experience. When I had Lyme disease, it was, I was very healthy, very athletic, very active. Um, and I got it. I got my tick bite gardening as I have had most of them. Uh, and all of a sudden I went to being, having the arthritis of someone who was really much, much older than I was. And oddly enough, when I sought help and was told, oh, you're just getting old. There was part of my mind that said, well, wait a minute, Wednesday I wasn't old, but Thursday all of a sudden I'm old? I didn't think it was that quick. How old were you when this was happening? I uh, wasn't yet 50. Right, right. So, anyway, um, so pay attention to your body and advocate for yourself politely, but people do need to advocate for themselves. Uh, and don't give up. <laughs> right, right. Yes, and don't. What about... I mean, I know there's a lot of people that their opinion, and even I can get this way sometimes, is just, well, I'm just going to stay away from everything. 
Hmm. Right. I'm just going to not engage. Like, you know, I'm going to stop fishing. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you, you seem, even though you had Lyme disease and it clearly took, from what you're saying, it took a big a major toll on your life. Um, but you don't seem to have stopped going, I'm still gardening. Your, taking your dog for walks and stuff like that. So what do you say to people that you know, are afraid to just get out there and, and get on with it? Uh, so there's, a, there's a risk in everything we do and there's a risk of ticks and there's a risk that you don't catch the tick and that you get sick. Um, but there's a certainty that your quality of life will be worse if you stay at home and you're afraid to go outside. Yes, that's, so, that's a really good point. I mean, I garden. Uh, I haven't stopped gardening. Even when I was incredibly sick, I was still gardening. I had right. to get help to get to the garden. Right. But um, I absolutely use repellents and I do tick checks. And I assure you, looking at myself in the mirror is not something that is enjoyable for anyone. <laughs> well, the dogs seem reasonably non-judgmental that's right yes, that's right that's right dogs it's but, uh, they're, they're but it's <laughs> just what you do to be safe and get on with your life well and i have to thank you because i mean i can't remember when i had you on the show last and my, in my mind i think it was five years ago um right um give or take um but after talking to you um i all the path i mean my garden has beds and paths and all the paths i went and got a dump truck of sand mm. and i put sand in all the pathways and i've actually uh, this year i got another dump truck and, and, and re-sanded to get more you know because it's sort of yeah. i don't know yeah. it just goes away somehow um so i i don't know because the argument was they don't like being dehydrated the sand mm -hmm. is super dry i mean it, it rains yeah. but it dries up very quickly mm -hmm. um so, and I also use kneeling pads instead of being down in stuff. And I just try to be, you know, don't be rolling around in the ground sort of thing. Um, but so the sand pathway, I don't know if they're preventing anything. I don't know. It's, it's it. Well, you actually do know um, because you're out in your garden. So sand paths are good. Um, also uh, fresh, uh fir spruce uh chips they don't like the smell of that mm. but once the smell wears off then it keeps the moisture in so sand this is a great solution and uh well and i was going to say one of the side benefits and this for anyone in a northern climate is that it makes the garden warmer like at the heat um i walk across like i've got a i've got a i got a wood chip path going from the driveway across the property to the garden. So I'm never on, I don't, I don't have to go into the grass if I don't want to. I can just stay on the wood chips and then into the garden. And I'm not kneeling and crawling around the wood chips. I'm just walking on them. So I think it's, yeah. Um, but when you hit that garden, you can just feel like a, I don't know, like a five degree yeah. difference because the sand is such a, a effective heat sink, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the side effect it's somewhat weed resistant. You still get weeds in your sand pathways, um, but it's analogous to wood chips, I would say, yeah. in, in terms of its weed suppression. But the heat, if, if, mm -hmm. if you're starved for heat, and I, you know, I have a short growing season, see, and yes, pretty much We're starved as, for heat. Yeah. Uh, as much as you can get, it does make a big difference. You can feel the heat in the garden, it's noticeable. Mm -hmm um so you know when the sun goes down it's warm for another hour or yeah, so yeah you know at the height of the day when it's 24 the garden's 20 the ambient air is like 26 yeah. right and i think that just has a positive net effect on the entire system um but i, I mean i never would have done that I mean, it costs money right to yeah. get sand um if i didn't think i was more concerned about my kids right because i mean I don't want to have to examine, especially as they're getting into their teenage years. I don't want to be examining. They don't want anyone. You know what I mean? Right. I just don't want to have to deal with it. So uh, I just thought, okay, I want them in the garden. I want them helping me. I want them to sort of have this as part of their lives growing up. How can I make this a bit safer? Um, so, yeah. I mean, at the very least, I don't worry about it as much. <laughs> yep. And, and uh, the darker the color of the sand, the better. Uh, oh. Yeah. I'm a big fan of sand. Okay, yeah. That'd be great if you get some black sand. That'd be awesome. 
Uh, my wife's not a big fa fan of the sand because it gets tracked into the garage and then it, you mm. know, it's kind of everywhere. But uh, it also looks really cool. You know, I have the YouTube channel and the, you'll have the garden that's a vibrant color and then the sand, mm. which is sort of monotone. So it, it yeah. really, it makes everything look, um, yeah, it makes everything sort of stand out. It has a real neat visual effect on the garden. So especially when you're doing these like overhead shots to show the whole thing. It, and none of these things I were by, it was all about, I don't want ticks on my kids. Yeah. And all these side benefits of this better visual heat, all this kind of neat stuff, right? But then there was also the side effect of the gardens on a, on a slight grade. So I, drainage problems I didn't have, I have now because the sand will wash down. Yep. Uh, <laughs> so I had to start creating like uh, French drains and all that stuff. Yeah, okay. so you get your own beach eventually. It is like a beach. It really is, yeah. Um, anyway, that I think... Uh, okay. I think we covered everything we can cover. Okay. Uh, Sounds I really good. appreciate you coming on my channel and I uh, hope we can do it again sometime. Okay. And, uh, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please like, share, subscribe, and until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Okay, Thanks be for safe. Okay, bye. <laughs> hey, if you want to help support everything I'm doing here, go to Vessies.com to buy whatever you need for your garden this year. And use my coupon code GAVS23 to get free shipping as long as there's a pack of seeds in the order and there's no oversized items in the order. Check out the description box of this video for details. You can buy everything you need from Bessie's. They have seeds, fruit bushes and trees, soil amendments, pest solutions, tools, clothing and lots of other stuff too. So yeah, if you want to help support everything I'm doing here and they sell something you need, buy from them using my coupon code and happy gardening.